Vulcans sometimes Vulcanians are a fictional extraterrestrial humanoid species in the Star Trek universe and media franchise. In the various Star Trek television series and movies, they are noted for their attempt to live by logic and reason with as little interference from emotion as possible. Known for their pronounced eyebrows and pointed ears, they originate from the fictional planet Vulcan. In the Star Trek universe, they were the first extraterrestrial species to make first contact with humans. The most famous actor to portray a Vulcan is Leonard Nimoy, who first played the character Mr. Spock picture shown at right in Star Trek, the original series 1966 <laughs> Development The Vulcan, Spock, first appeared in the original 1965 Star Trek pilot, The Cage. Shown to studio executives, show creator Gene Roddenberry revealed in 1964 that he wanted an alien as part of the ship's crew, but knew that budget restraints would limit makeup choices. He chose actor Leonard Nimoy because of his high Slavic cheekbones and interesting face. And, with those cheekbones some sort of pointed ear might go well. Nimoy later commented that Roddenberry felt the presence of an alien would establish that we were in the 23rd century and that interplanetary travel was an established fact. Topic: Biology. Topic: Physical characteristics. Vulcans are depicted as similar in appearance to humans, as budget constraints in the original series did not allow for elaborate makeup. All Vulcans have arched and upswept eyebrows and pointy ears. Caucasoid actors portraying Vulcans are given a greenish hue to their skin. When necessary, a Vulcan's on-screen blood is green due to copper-based hemocyanin. Vulcans are said to possess an inner eyelid, or nictitating membrane, which protects their vision from bright light. In addition, their hearts are located on the right side of the torso, between the ribs and pelvis, as Dr. McCoy once says about Spock, he is lucky that his heart is where his liver should be, or he'd be dead. Topic. Diet Vulcans are vegetarians by choice and were omnivores in ages past. It is a Vulcan custom for guests in the home to prepare meals for their hosts. Vulcans are said to not drink alcohol, though they are often depicted as doing so. In an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Quark alludes to Vulcans becoming inebriated by ingesting chocolate. Topic. Mating drive Every seven years, Vulcan males and females experience an overpowering hormone imbalance known as pon far. Once triggered, a Vulcan must have sexual intercourse with someone or the chemical imbalance may cause insanity, loss of self-control, and death. Despite popular opinion, TOS writer and story editor, Dorothy C. Fontana, insists that pon far is not the only time that Vulcans feel sexual desire or engage in sexual activity. Vulcans mate normally any time they want to. However, every seven years you do the ritual, the ceremony, the whole thing. The biological urge, you must, but any other time as any other emotion. Humanoid emotion. When you're in love. When you want to, you know when the urge is there, you do it. This every seven years business was taken too literally by too many people who don't stop and understand. We didn't mean it only every seven years. I mean, every seven years would be a little bad, and it would not explain the Vulcans of many different ages that are not seven years apart. If a mate is not available, there are other ways to relieve the effects of the pawn far, including meditation, violence, infection, shock, and simulation. Topic. Other characteristics Vulcans are typically depicted as stronger, faster, and longer lived than humans. There are instances of them living over 220 years. Having evolved on a desert world, Vulcans can survive without water for longer periods than humans. Vulcans can also go without sleep for as long as two weeks.
Topic: Psychology. Topic: Emotion. Vulcans are known as logical beings who have removed emotions from their lives. The Vulcan character, Spock, struggles with this throughout the original series as he is half-human. Topol states that paranoia and homicidal rage were common on Vulcan before the adoption of Surik's code of emotional control. Not all Vulcan characters follow the path of pure logic, some instead choose to embrace emotions. A group of renegade Vulcans who believed in this was encountered in the Star Trek, Enterprise episode, Fusion. While Spock's half-brother Cybok, seen in the film Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, was also fully emotional. An episode of Enterprise titled, E Squared, featured an elderly Topol in an alternative timeline who had embraced emotion and allowed her half-human son, Lorian, to do likewise. In the pilot episode, The Cage, Spock showed much more emotion. This was due to the uncertainty about the character, which Nimoy subsequently and quickly developed. Topic. Telepathy Vulcans are telepaths. Beginning in the original series, the character Spock was able to mind meld see below by touching another being and share thoughts. Vulcans have also displayed telepathy at great distance and through walls. Topic. Mind melds A mind meld, first depicted in the TOS episode, Dagger of the Mind, is a technique for sharing thoughts, experiences, memories, and knowledge with another individual, essentially a limited form of telepathy. It usually requires physical contact with a subject, though instances of mind melds without contact have been seen. Vulcans can perform mind melds with members of most other species. The Vulcan character Spock also successfully mind melded with a machine and was in telepathic contact with the mechanical probe V'ger. Mind melds have been used to erase memories, as Spock performed on James T. Kirk. A mind meld was used to rejoin Spock's catra see below, with his physical body. Mind melds can also allow more than one mind to experience memories and sensations, and sometimes even interact with the memories. Some species are able to resist mind melds. Topic. Catra Some Vulcans appear able to cheat death by implanting their catra, essentially their living essence or spirit, into an object or another person via a form of mind meld just before death. Dr. Julian Bashir in the episode, The Passenger, of Deep Space Nine referred to this phenomenon as synaptic pattern displacement. The history and mechanics of the Catra have never been discussed in great detail in canon. The Star Trek, Enterprise Season 4 trilogy of episodes, The Forge, Awakening, and Kershara, do however reveal some of the history of mind-melding and the journey of the Catra of Surik to modern times. Catras can, on rare occasions, be returned to the body, effectively bringing an individual back from the dead. Such was the case with Spock, who, near the end of Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, implanted his Catra into the mind of Dr. McCoy before sacrificing his life to save the USS Enterprise from Khan's attack. Following Spock's death, McCoy began exhibiting Vulcan-like behavior and was briefly institutionalized. It was later discovered that Spock's body came to rest on the Genesis planet after his burial in space, and was regenerated. He was recovered and was taken with McCoy to Mount Seleia on Vulcan where a Vulcan high priestess named Tulur performed a rare, seldom attempted ritual called the Fal Tor Pan, literally, refusion, which removed the Catra from McCoy and implanted it into Spock's regenerated body. Subsequently, Spock recovered, although it took some time to fully retrain his mind. Eventually, Spock's original memories apparently reasserted themselves, and he resumed his duties in Starfleet, albeit with trial and error before the old Spock was completely back. Topic. Culture Topic. Language 
The Vulcan language was the first alien language introduced in the Star Trek franchise. In the Star Trek, the original series episode, Amuck Time, including the concept of Pon Far, time of mating. Afterwards, one word was said in the episode, Journey to Babel, and some others in Star Trek, The Next Generation and Star Trek, Voyager. The language features mostly in several chapters of Star Trek, Enterprise. Dialogue or phrases in Vulcan appeared in Star Trek, The Motion Picture, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock and Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. It has also appeared in novels derived from the franchise, like the word, Tahila, friend, brother, lover, from Gene Roddenberry's novelization of Star Trek, The Motion Picture. The scene in Star Trek, The Motion Picture was filmed with actors speaking English and later dubbed in Vulcan. It ends with the phrase, D.I.F. Tor He Smusma, Live Long and Prosper. According to Robert Wise's commentary in the Director's Edition DVD, it was Gene Roddenberry's idea to have the Vulcans speak their own language. The translation into Vulcan was made by actor James Doohan. Doohan observed the actor's lip movements and created new vocal sounds for them to dub over their original English. According to the DVD commentary of the film Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, actors Leonard Nimoy and Kirstie Alley, portraying Spock and Savick respectively, also spoke their lines in English, and later dubbed in Vulcan at least partially designed by linguist Mark Okren that corresponded with the movements of their mouths in the scene. Topic. Names The treatment of Vulcan names has been erratic throughout Star Trek's production history. Early on, female Vulcans were typically given names beginning with T, followed by an apostrophe then a P. The earliest reference to Vulcan names following a set pattern dates back to a May 3, 1966 memo from TOS producer Robert H. Justman to Gene Roddenberry later reprinted in the book The Making of Star Trek in which Justman recommended that all Vulcan names begin with SP and end with K and have exactly five letters. It is clear from the context of the book, however, that the memo was intended as a joke, as the series of memos ends up discussing the pronunciation of such names as Spook, Spilk, and Spork. Only non canonical sources have provided any Vulcans with family names, which are usually spoken of as defying attempts at both human pronunciation, especially with English language phonemes, and human typesetting, especially with the characters of the modern Latin alphabet used for the English language. Hence, no canonical source has given any family names to any Vulcan characters, and indeed, every one of the personal names previously mentioned are all officially described as being only Latin alphabetical and English phonetic approximations of the real ones. In the TOS episode, This Side of Paradise, Spock is asked if he has another name, to which he replies, you couldn't pronounce it. Topic. Marriage. Vulcans practice arranged marriage, in which a male and a female are bonded as children, with consummation at a later date. Spock explains that this childhood pairing has no one for one human analogue, as it is considered less than a full marriage, but more than simply a betrothal. This is why Spock first described T'Pring as his wife, before later explaining that this was an incorrect approximation. Following adult union, it is customary for the couple to remain on Vulcan for at least one Vulcan year before conducting off-world travel, though it is possible to defer this requirement until a later date, upon negotiation with the male's family. The state of Pon Far is not required for marriage to occur. The mating session of a Vulcan Pon Far includes the private act of sex indifferentiated from the human version of mating. A Vulcan female can challenge the proposed bonding by calling for Kun ut kal if fi, meaning marriage or challenge, in which a challenger for marriage engages the bonded male in a fight to the death. Alternatively, the bonded male has the option of rejecting his intended bride and choosing another. It is acceptable for a male to release his mate from marriage, effectively the same as a divorce. It is not established whether females have the same option, and to Pring stated in a muck time that a kun ut kal if fee challenge was the only way she could legally divorce Spock.
Topic: Family. It is customary for Vulcan children to undertake an initiation ordeal known as the Cause One, sometimes spelled Caswan, in which they are left to fend for themselves in the desert for a specific period of time. Not all children survive this rite of passage. Tapol underwent the ritual, while Tuvok experienced a variation known as the Taluth. The Cause One was first introduced in the Star Trek, the animated series episode, Yesteryear in which Spock's experience as a child was detailed. Contrary to the Vulcan image of expressing no emotion, family bonds can be strong and affectionate just as they are for humans. Tuvok expressed his love for his wife on a few occasions without actually using the term. Sarek openly expressed affection for both his human wives, and a clear bond of love existed between Tapol and her mother, Tez. Fighting and self-defense Although generally adhering to a philosophy of nonviolence, Vulcans have developed martial arts and techniques of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Vulcan martial arts are highly ritualistic and based on philosophy, similar to human counterparts such as karate and silat. The most extreme example is the kun ut kal if fi, or fight to the death, described earlier, though one particular discipline is known as sus man. Named for Star Trek, Enterprise producer Mike Sussman. Topic. Nerve pinching Many Vulcans are skilled in a self-defense technique known as the Vulcan nerve pinch, or neck pinch, which targets a precise location on the neck, rendering the victim unconscious sometimes instantly, sometimes after a short delay depending on the subject. The pinch was first depicted in production in the TOS episode, The Enemy Within, but first aired one episode broadcast earlier, in The Naked Time. The mechanics of the pinch have never been explained in on-screen canon. While practiced mainly by Vulcans, it is apparently not exclusive to their race. For example, Jonathan Archer and Jean-Luc Picard are depicted as having mastered the technique after each became involved in a Vulcan telepathic ritual. Archer holding the Catra of Surak, Picard having undergone a mind meld with Sarek, as well as later apparently undergoing a mind meld with Spock, who was also skilled in combat beyond simply using the nerve pinch after Sarek's death in the second part of the two-part episode Unification. Seven of Nine is depicted as capable of using this ability in the episode of Voyager, The Raven. She is able to defend herself against the Vulcan Tuvok, who is attempting to subdue her with the pinch, and then successfully use the pinch against him. It is assumed her knowledge of the pinch was part of her wealth of Borg knowledge, which they would have gained by assimilating Vulcans capable of using the pinch. The android data also displayed this ability in Unification, Part 2. None of these four characters, however, were depicted using the skill regularly. Leonard McCoy attempted to use the neck pinch while carrying Spock's Catra in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, but was unsuccessful due to his arthritis. In Whom Gods Destroy, Garth of Izar performs the neck pinch on Orion female Marta while masquerading as Spock, using his shape-shifting ability. Tongo Rad, a Cachalon, employed a similar technique to render a Starfleet officer unconscious by driving his thumbs suddenly and firmly into the sides of the officer's neck in the original series episode, The Way to Eden. In Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, Spock, while he and Kirk were riding on a San Francisco City bus, used the nerve pinch to subdue a rude punk who had ignored Kirk's asking to turn off his boom box as his music was too loud, to the other passenger's relief. The technique was also used by Spock to subdue James Kirk in the 2009 film, when Kirk opposes Spock's decision as captain of the USS Enterprise to reunite with the remainder of Starfleet in the Laurentian system, instead of pursuing Nero immediately. Depictions of the effects of a nerve pinch vary. In The Enterprise Incident, Spock pretended to apply a Vulcan death grip to Kirk, in order to convince Romulan onlookers that Kirk had been killed. The death grip was later described as fake. Spock had used a particularly powerful nerve pinch to place Kirk in a deep unconsciousness that convincingly resembled death, to the extent that Kirk's life signs did not register on the sensors in the Enterprise sickbay. 
Kirk spontaneously awoke a short time later, complaining of neck pain but suffering no lasting injury. The neck pinch itself, referred to in scripts as FSNP or famous Spock neck pinch, was created by Leonard Nimoy, who objected to a scene in The Enemy Within, in which a transporter malfunction had divided Kirk between his good and evil selves that required Spock to render the evil Kirk unconscious and subduing him by hitting him over the head with the butt of a phaser. Nimoy was convinced that such overt violence, in addition to being too similar to that found in many crime dramas of the time, was uncharacteristic of the strictly logical Spock, and suggested the neck pinch as a less emotional alternative. Topic. Infinite diversity in infinite combinations The theme of infinite diversity in infinite combinations is symbolized by the Vulcans in a kol ut shan represented as a pendant of yellow and white gold with a circle and triangle resting upon each other and adorned with a white jewel in the center in an issue of the humanist Majel Barrett claimed that the philosophy of infinite diversity in infinite combinations was based on the teachings of Rabbi Maimonides. Spock wore the symbol during important gatherings and ceremonies as part of his dress uniform. It appeared for the first time in the Star Trek, the original series TOS episode, Is There in Truth No Beauty? It also appeared in Spock's quarters in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, and Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. In the series Star Trek, Enterprise, Topol is given, through her in name only husband Koss, an IDIC pendant from her mother Tez that projects a holographic relief, enabling Topol and Captain Archer to find the location where Tez and the Saranites are hiding. Also in Star Trek, Enterprise, Topol, the science officer, holds an IDIC pendant in Terra Prime, while she is in mourning for her dying cloned child Elizabeth, named in honor of Charles. Trip. Tucker's deceased sister. In the Enterprise episode, The Endorian Incident, the IDIC symbol appears on small playing pieces that are being used to construct a makeshift map of the Pajem catacombs in an attempt to escape. In the series DS9 episode, Take Me Out to the Hollow Suite, Captain Solok, an Academy classmate and longtime rival of Benjamin Sisko, challenges Sisko and other DS9 personnel to a baseball game against his Vulcan team, the Logicians. The IDIC symbol appears on the Vulcan's ball caps. The Vulcan IDIC pendant was designed by Gene Roddenberry as a marketing premium long before the third season. As early as the end of the first season, fans of the show had begun writing and asking for copies of the scripts, film clip frames, etc., and these were soon sold through Roddenberry's mailorder company, Lincoln Enterprises, founded by B.J.O. Trimble and her husband John before they were fired by Roddenberry and the business turned over to Majel Barrett. As evidenced in some of his letters and memos, Roddenberry was fond of circle and triangle designs and had wanted to use them for purposes of theatrical unity as early as the first seasons. The Return of the Archons. As reported by editor Ruth Berman, issue number one, Inside Star Trek, July 1968, pp. 15 to 16. Ardent rock hound and amateur lapidary. Roddenberry came up with the Vulcan philosophy after he presented Leonard Nimoy with a unique, handcrafted piece of jewelry, a pendant, sick of polished yellow gold circle and Florentine white gold triangle, with a stone of brilliant white fabulite, an artificial gem, developed by the laser industry and used in space mechanisms for its optical qualities, and thus well suited as a gift for an actor in a science fiction show. Readers were encouraged to submit their interest in such a product to the then Star Trek Enterprises mail order firm. It was noted that less expensive materials would keep costs down. According to William Shatner in Star Trek Memories, the book about TOS he dictated to Chris Kresge, IDIC was only worked into the episode, Is There in Truth No Beauty? As an afterthought, the actors all knew it was a mere advertising toy. Reportedly, Leonard Nimoy was asked to wear it and refused, so it was passed on to Shatner. When he also refused, Nimoy reluctantly agreed to wear it. At the last minute, Roddenberry sent down several pages of new script for the dinner scene, in which Spock was to give a long-winded explanation of the philosophy. 
The actors refused to film it until Roddenberry cut it down. Ethics <inaudible> 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 In the Star Trek universe, Vulcans are seen to have a consistent ethical system involving satisfying the preferences of the greatest number of people, even if it means sacrificing the interests of a fewer number of people. This perspective is most similar to the human utilitarian ethical system. In Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Spock sacrifices himself to save the lives of those on the Enterprise, stating that, "...the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one." In Star Trek Into Darkness 2013, Spock uses the same logic to justify his attempt to sacrifice himself. In the Star Trek, the original series episode, The Galileo 7, Spock states that, It is more rational to sacrifice one life than six. In Star Trek, Enterprise, T'Pol states that, The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Is a Vulcan axiom. Generally, however, Vulcans are portrayed as adopting a nonviolent stance unless there is a need to sacrifice one life to save many. In the Star Trek, the original series episode, Journey to Babel, Spock says that, Vulcans do not approve of violence, and that it is illogical, to kill without reason. <laughs> Homeworld The Vulcan homeworld, also named Vulcan, was mentioned in the original series, and in the script adaptation anthology Star Trek II, author James Blish put the planet in orbit around the star 40 Eridani A, 16 light years from Earth, an identification later adopted by Roddenberry. Vulcan is a reddish Minshara class planet. Its inhabitants were originally called Vulcanians. Spock used this name in the TOS episodes, A Taste of Armageddon, and Court Martial as did Federation colonists in This Side of Paradise, and Harry Mudd in Mudd's Women, in Season 1 of TOS, in The Man Trap. While Uhura is attempting to make conversation with Spock, he informs her that Vulcan has no moon. Much of its surface consists of deserts and mountain ranges, and large areas are set aside as wilderness preserves. It is much hotter, it has a stronger surface gravity, and its atmosphere is thinner than that of Earth. As a result of these factors, humans tend to tire out more quickly than native Vulcans. The capital of and largest city on Vulcan is Shikar. Other major cities on Vulcan include Vulcan Arigar, Tapal, Gol, Rall, and Kir. Most major governmental bodies and embassies are located in Shikar, including the Vulcan High Command historically, the first United Earth Embassy on Vulcan, and the Vulcan Science Academy. Topic. Timeline divergence In the 2009 film Star Trek, the Kelvin timeline Vulcan is destroyed by a prime timeline Romulan ship commanded by Nero. Using his ship's mining tools, Nero drilled into the core of the planet to deliver a small amount of red matter, creating a singularity within the planet. The black hole created consumed the planet from the inside, killing almost all of its inhabitants. By Star Trek Into Darkness a Vulcan colony had been established named New Vulcan. New Vulcan is effectively the Vulcan home world in the alternate timeline. In Star Trek Beyond, Vulcan couriers deliver news to Mr. Spock that his original timeline counterpart Ambassador Spock has died. History Vulcans once practiced a form of polytheism, this can be seen in gods of war, peace, and death depicted on the stone of Gol, as well as the celebration of Rumuri. The DVD commentary for Amuk Time says that TOS writer DC Fontana named the Vulcan god of death, Sheriel, a bust of whom is seen in Spock's quarters. In about the 4th century AD, Vulcans emerged from their violent tendencies and civil wars under a philosopher named Surik, who advocated the suppressing of emotion in favor of logic. This period was known as the Great Awakening, and much of present-day Vulcan philosophy emerged from this period. 
According to the Star Trek New Frontier book series, which, like all novels, are not considered canon, the Great Awakening caused many wars and conflicts to occur amongst various Vulcan tribes. Those who supported Surik's cause would become separated from friends and even close family members who did not. For cases in which parents were separated by this, a ritual was created called the Kunit Kafar, a battle to determine which parent would maintain their child. Despite the acceptance of Surik's teachings, generations of imperfect copies of his writings, combined with changes in the Vulcan language over time, resulted in a diluted form of the culture he instituted. Surik's views and lifestyle were not universally accepted by Vulcan society. One particular group of Vulcans who called themselves, "...those who march beneath the raptor's wings." were so adamant in their opposition against Surik that it resulted in a nuclear war fought with neutron bombs, of which Surik himself became a victim. After a time the portion of Vulcan society who rejected Surik's teachings left the planet for the stars. These Vulcan separatists would eventually become known as the Romulans. Knowledge of the common ancestry of Romulans and Vulcans would obscure into myth over the millennia, and while some Vulcans had direct dealings with Romulans in the 22nd century, the common ancestry would not become widely known until the mid-23rd century. A great deal of Star Trek spin-off fiction, in particular the novel The Romulan Way by Diane Duane and Peter Morwood, has stated that the leader of the Vulcan-Romulan migration was a close follower of Surix named Stask. Stask would see the founding of the Romulan Empire, but was killed by political factions shortly thereafter. Vulcans did recover from the effects of barbarism and turn much of their attention to space travel for 1,500 years. What would later become known as the Vulcan High Command was initially formed to orchestrate space exploration, but it ended up seizing control of the Vulcan government. Spock was one of three Starfleet officers from the 23rd century who travel in time to 1930s New York City, in the TOS episode, The City on the Edge of Forever. He would also briefly travel to Earth in 1968 on a mission, in the episode, Assignment, Earth, accidentally in 1969, in Tomorrow is Yesterday, and again in 1986, in Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, technically speaking, these three events occurred after the founding of the Federation, but are included here as they constitute pre-first contact encounters with contemporary humans. In 1957, the launch of Sputnik I, Earth's first artificial satellite, was observed by a Vulcan vessel that subsequently crashed on the planet, marooning several crew members for a number of months in Carbon Creek, Pennsylvania. This constituted the first true contact between humans and Vulcans, but it was never recorded as such as the humans were unaware of the alien nature of their guests. On April 5, 2063, Vulcans and humans made official first contact near the town of Bozeman, Montana, following the successful test of Earth scientist Zephram Cochran's first warp-powered starship, as depicted in Star Trek, First Contact. In 2097, the Vulcans annexed the Andorian planetoid Waitan and renamed it Pan Makar. In 2105, the Vulcans and the Andorians agreed to a compromise over Waitan, Pan Makar. Still, tensions continued due to the threat of mutual annihilation. By the 22nd century of Star Trek, the Vulcan High Command is apparently a form of military government that controls both the Vulcan space fleet and most of the planet itself. Most of the Vulcans, including T'Pol, from Star Trek, Enterprise served the High Command. It is dissolved in the early fourth season of Star Trek, Enterprise. In 2151, Subcommander Topol joined the crew of the Earth Starfleet vessel Enterprise NX-01, within a couple of weeks setting a Vulcan endurance record for serving aboard a human vessel. In 2154, Topol became a commissioned officer with Starfleet. Throughout the run of Star Trek, Enterprise, Captain Jonathan Archer frequently had run-ins with the High Command. Even after Archer proved conclusively, several times, that he was able to travel through time, the High Command stubbornly refused to acknowledge the possibility that time travel could ever be possible although Topol tried to keep an open mind. The High Command, on at least one occasion, sent Vulcan starships to actively spy on the Enterprise and report on the ship's activities see episode, Breaking the Ice, an act that infuriated Archer. However, this was not the end of the High Command's questionable activities. 
They appeared to participate in open acts of persecution towards other Vulcans, such as isolating and quarantining victims of Ponar syndrome rather than treating them, prejudicial acts against any Vulcan proven to have committed a mind meld, and hunting down and capturing, even often killing, members of the underground dissident group, the Seranites. In 2154, Vilas, the head of the High Command and undercover agent for the Romulans, bombed the United Earth Embassy on Vulcan in an attempt to frame and eliminate all Seranites while simultaneously attempting an invasion of Andoria. He was foiled by the crew of the Enterprise. During these events, the Kershara, a device containing the original writings of Surik, was discovered by Jonathan Archer. This led to the prompt dissolution of the High Command and a reevaluation of traditional values. It also resulted in Vulcan agreeing to stop looking over Earth's shoulder in space exploration matters. It was revealed to viewers that the High Command's illogical and often emotionally based actions were, in reality, the result of covert Romulan influence. The Romulans had secretly made contact with Vilas and attempted to reunify their long lost peoples. After the invasion of Andoria was foiled, the High Command was disbanded and Vilas was dismissed from his post. Subsequently, the altered political climate on Vulcan caused the undercover Romulan operative Talok to leave Vulcan, apparently ending the infiltration. After the dissolution of the High Command, the Vulcan space fleet experienced a serious shortage of personnel, many of whom were still sympathetic to the Old Guard. Minister Tapau, who now oversaw Vulcan's fleet operations, attempted to rebuild the fleet with personnel who understood true logic. On August 12, 2161, Vulcan became one of the founding members of the United Federation of Planets. In the time of Star Trek, Enterprise, Vulcans are often seen to be rather arrogant and cold in their behavior towards humans. It is explained that after first contact, Vulcan shared technology with Earth, but many humans, such as Jonathan Archer, greatly resented the fact that Vulcans seemed to be holding back humanity's efforts at space travel. Sovel, Vulcan's ambassador to Earth, appeared particularly distrustful of humans, and was often at odds with Archer and his crew. Sovel later justified this behavior in the fourth season episode, The Forge. We don't know what to do about humans. Of all the species we've made contact with, yours is the only one we can't define. You have the arrogance of Andorians, the stubborn pride of Tellarites. One moment you're as driven by your emotions as Klingons, and the next, you confound us by suddenly embracing logic. Sovel also explained that, since Earth recovered from World War III far more quickly than Vulcan did from its equivalent in The Forge and its sequel episodes, it is said that Vulcans took almost a thousand years to fully rebuild their society after their last catastrophic war. It alarmed many Vulcans, who were confused as to how to deal with a rapidly growing and emotional society such as Earth's. After the overthrow of the corrupt Vulcan High Command and the death of Admiral Maxwell Forrest, who sacrificed his life to save Sovel from a terrorist attack, the attitudes of Sovel, and Vulcan society in general, became more cordial and accepting towards humanity. Topic. Star Trek 2009 Alternative Timeline In the alternative timeline of the 2009 film, the planet Vulcan is destroyed in 2258 by the mad Romulan known as Nero Eric Bana, who had time traveled from the future. Using his space mining vessel, the Narada, Nero created a singularity in Vulcan's planetary core as part of his quest to avenge the destruction of Romulus. The resulting implosion destroyed Vulcan, killing most of its 6 billion inhabitants. Only around 10,000 managed to escape, including Spock and some of the elders. However, the film's writers have stated that this does not include Vulcans who were living off-planet at the time. At the end of the film, Spock Prime tells the younger Spock a suitable planet has been located to establish a colony for the surviving Vulcans. This world is subsequently referred to in the sequel Star Trek Into Darkness as New Vulcan. New Vulcan remains the capital of the Vulcan state, including all of Vulcan's offworld colonies, now known as the Confederacy of Surik. Topic: <laughs> Vulcan Salute. Leonard Nimoy discussed the origin of the Vulcan Salute in his autobiography I Am Spock. As a bit of stage business in the episode 
Amok time. He invented the Vulcan salute to accompany the iconic live long and prosper phrase created by Theodore Sturgeon as part of his script for Amok time. Based on the hand symbol used by Jewish priests Kohanim, during the priestly blessing in the synagogue, the gesture actually emulates the initial shin of Shaddai, or the Almighty. Nimoy's studies later taught him to associate it with the Shekhinah, the feminine aspect of God. He produced his first book of photography based on that concept, also titled Shekhinah. He referenced this on William Shatner's Raw Nerve. On numerous occasions, for example in the 1983 TV special Star Trek Memories, which is often syndicated along with the original series, Nimoy recounts how as a child, he peeked during the blessing and witnessed the gesture, although the congregation are supposed to put hands over eyes or turn away at this moment in acknowledgement of the presence of the Almighty. Topic. See also Stoicism Vulcan, Alberta. A town in Canada that has incorporated Star Trek themes due to its name. Vulcan hypothetical planet.